If A is an M by N matrix, then the subspace of RM spanned by the column vectors of A is denoted call of A and called the column space of the matrix A. Notice that the column space is a subspace of RM, M being the number of rows in the matrix, because each column vector will have as many entries as there are rows. So that's what the column space of a matrix is. In this video, we'll prove that the column space is indeed a subspace of RM. We'll see an important theorem connecting the column space of a matrix to the non-homogeneous equation AX equals B. We'll do some examples of determining if a vector is in the column space of a matrix or not, and we'll finish by seeing how to find a basis for a column space. There are chapters in the description if you want to skip around the video. Let's begin by proving that the column space of a matrix A is a subspace of RM. To do this, we just need to prove that the column space is closed with respect to addition and with respect to scalar multiplication. Beginning with addition, we take two arbitrary elements from the column space of A. Now, A has N columns, so for something to be in the column space of A means that it can be written as a linear linear combination of the n columns of A. So the first arbitrary element, say, is x1, c1, plus x2, c2, and so on up to xn, cn, a linear combination of the n columns of A. That's an element of the column space. The other arbitrary element we'll write as y1, c1, plus y2, c2, and so on. We need to show if we take two arbitrary elements from the column space, their sum is also in the column space. Their sum is also a linear combination of the column vectors. And that's very straightforward. We see when we add these two members of the column space together, what we get is x1 plus y1 times the column vector c1 plus x2 times y2 times the column vector c2 and so on up to xn plus yn times the column vector cn. Clearly, we can just rewrite this like this, which is very evidently a linear combination of the n column vectors, and thus it's an element of the column space of A. So the column space is closed with respect to addition. Scalar multiplication is even easier. Here's an arbitrary member of the column space. It's a linear combination of the n column vectors. If we multiply it by any scalar k, well, that's equal to k times x1 times the column vector c1 plus k times x2 times the column vector c2, and so on, up to k times xn times the column vector cn. So if we multiply a member of the column space by a scalar, we get a linear combination of the column vectors, which of course is also a member of the column space by definition. So we've established that the column space of A is a subspace of Rm. Now, here's a theorem indicating to us some of the importance of the column space of a matrix. A system of linear equations, Ax equals B, turns out to be consistent, meaning there is a solution, if and only if the vector B is in the column space of A. Let's see why this is. First, it's important that you understand this way to represent matrix multiplication. If we have this M by N matrix A, and say this column vector X with N entries, then the product A times X can be written as a linear combination of the column vectors of A. Because how does matrix multiplication work? Well, if we multiply these guys together, we would have row 1 being multiplied by those entries in X, and then they'd get added together. You can notice that the element from the first column would get multiplied by X1. The element from the second column would get multiplied by X2, and so on. Eventually, we'd move on to row 2, and that would get multiplied by this column vector, and everything would be added together. And we would see, again, that the entry in the first column is multiplied by X1 the entry in the second column is multiplied by x2, and so on. The entry in the nth column gets multiplied by xn. That's why the product a times x can be written as x1 times the column vector c1 
plus x2 times the column vector c2, and so on, plus xn times the column vector cn. We can split this matrix multiplication up into a sum of scalars times column vectors. With that, it's pretty easy to see why this theorem is true. If we know that ax equals b is consistent, meaning there is a solution, then certainly b is an element of the column space. Because if ax equals b, well, like we just said, ax is a linear combination of the column vectors. That's how this multiplication works. So if ax equals b, then b is a linear combination of the column vectors, and thus b is an element of the column space of A by definition. On the other hand, what if we assume that b is in the column space? Well then, b can be written like this, as a linear combination of the column vectors. But that would mean that ax equals b is consistent with this solution, x equals and then all of these scalars that we got from assuming that B is in the column space. Again, assuming B is in the column space means we can write it as a linear combination of the column vectors, but then as we discussed, this is the same as A times X if we let X be the column vector containing all of those scalars from B. And thus, AX equals B is consistent with this column vector as a solution. So indeed, a system of linear equations AX equals B is consistent if and only if B is in the column space of A. And we can use this theorem to help us determine if a column vector is in the column space or not. Let's do two examples of determining if the linear system AX equals B is consistent. If so, we'll express B as a linear combination of the column vectors of A, because as we just saw, if this system is consistent, then B is in the column space. Here's our first system, A times X equals B. To figure out if it's consistent, let's represent it with an augmented matrix and then reduce it to reduced row echelon form. Here is our augmented matrix. You can see we have the coefficients on the left, and then the rightmost column comes from the constants in that B column vector. Now, if we transform this to reduced row echelon form through Gauss-Jordan elimination, this is the matrix we get. Now, does this represent a consistent system? The answer is no, because of this final row. This final row says that 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 0x3 equals 1. Certainly, we can't multiply a bunch of stuff by zero, add it together, and get one. The system is not consistent. And thus, by the theorem we just went over, this column vector B is not in the column space of A. If it were, there would have to be a solution to this system, but we see there's not. Let's move on to the next example. Here's our system, AX equals B. Again, we'll represent this system with an augmented matrix and then transform it to reduced row echelon form through Gauss-Jordan elimination. That gets us here, and this does represent a consistent system. It gives us a solution, X1 equals one, X2 equals negative three, and X3 equals one. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson on Gauss-Jordan elimination if you need a review. So there is our solution vector, and this means indeed B is in the column space of A. And this solution vector tells us how to write B as a linear combination of the column vectors. Because x1 is one, we need one copy of the column vector C1. Because x2 is negative three, we need negative three copies of the column vector C2. Because x3 is one, we need one copy of the column vector C3. So to write B as a linear combination of the columns of A, it's like this, B equals C1 plus negative three C2 plus C3. And it's easy to see that this works. Let's do the math up here. We need for the first row, one copy of column one, plus negative three copies of column two, plus one copy of column three. So that's going to be one, plus negative three times negative one, which is positive three, plus one. Of course, this is equal to five as desired. Same idea for row two. We'd have one copy of column one, 
plus negative three times the column two entry, which is three, plus one copy of column three, that row two entry from column three is one. This is nine minus nine, which is zero, plus one, which of course is correct. In row three, again, we'd have one from column one, plus negative three times this one from column two, plus this one from column three. This turns out to be negative one as desired. So yes, B is in the column space of A. This is how you write it as a linear combination of the column vectors. This is a consistent system of linear equations. We'll finish by seeing how to find a basis for the column space. But before we do that, it's important that you know elementary row operations Although they don't change the row space of a matrix, they do change the column space. Here are two matrices, A and B. Clearly, they are row equivalent. We could get from A to B by subtracting two copies of row one from row two. However, it's evident that these two matrices do not have the same column space. The column space of A is the span of this column vector one, two since the other column vector is just a multiple of one, two. Whereas the column space of B is the span of this column vector, one, zero. The other column vector, of course, is just a multiple of one, zero. Clearly, these spans, which are the column spaces, are not the same. Row operations do change the column spaces of matrices. So finding a basis for the column space isn't quite as simple as just getting a matrix to row echelon form and using that. Now, if a matrix, say R, is in row echelon form, getting a basis for the column space is as easy as you would hope. The column vectors with the leading ones of the row vectors form a basis for the column space of a row echelon matrix. In this case, column one has a leading one, column two has a leading one, and column five has a leading one. So it's these three columns, one, two, and five, that form a basis for the column space. The column space of this matrix is the span of those three column vectors containing the leading ones. But what if a matrix is not in row echelon form? Like we saw, transforming it into row echelon form can change the column space. So how do we figure this out? Thankfully, this too is pretty easy. If we want to find a basis for the column space of this matrix, we can transform it into row echelon form. And although the column spaces are different, this row echelon form does still give us important information. The column vectors in the row echelon form matrix that contain the leading ones are columns one and two in this case. Although these columns are not a basis for the column space of this matrix, the corresponding columns in the original matrix do form a basis for the column space. In short, we reduce the matrix to row echelon form, find that it's columns one and two that form a basis for the column space of the row echelon form, and thus, it's columns one and two of the original matrix that form a basis for the column space. So the column of this matrix that we could call matrix A is the span of columns one and two because it was columns one and two that contained the leading ones in the row echelon form. Once more, the column vectors containing the leading ones of a row echelon matrix form a basis for the column space, and the corresponding column vectors form a basis for the column space of any other row equivalent matrix. I'll leave a link in the description to a lesson where we do some more examples of finding the basis for a column space. So that's what the column space of a matrix is and some important facts about it. Once more, the column space of a matrix is simply the span of its column vectors and it's denoted call of A. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and if you find these linear algebra videos helpful, please consider supporting Wrath of Math on Patreon. Link in the description description, it's a huge help. Thanks for watching.